Welcome. My name is Samantha. I'm the events coordinator here at Bear Pond Books. Thank you for coming to our poetry reading with two Vermont poets, Allison Prine and Bianca Stone. Um, I know we're all sick of the weather lately, but it's probably fitting to have water falling from the sky for this reading because the poems I found in Allison and Bianca's newest books are soaked in grief and the thin veil between the living and the departed. And rather than feel depressed, um, I think these words and playful images give you a sense of reverie and wonder. I love the playfulness in Bianca's Mobius Strip Club of Grief and the honesty of Allison's retrospect in Steel. If you don't already have a copy, I urge you to pick one up. We have them here on the table with the roses and the registers are open all night and the poets will be signing their books after the reading. Each poet will read and talk for about 15 to 20 minutes each and then we'll open it up for <coughs> Q&A. I'd like to remind everyone at this time to please mute or turn off your cell phones and to let you know that the front door is locked, so if you need to leave during the event, please use the back door, which is to my right. Um, the front door will reopen after the reading. The bathroom is also located at the back of the store, to the right of the back door. And please help yourself to refreshments on the side table. I'd like to thank the Vermont Arts Council for featuring this event as a Vermont Arts 2018 program. And I'd also like to thank Orca Media and WGDR, Goddard College Community Radio. They are filming and recording tonight's event. Um, I'd like to pass around our newsletter because if you'd like to hear these recordings and to watch the video, um, our newsletter is a good place to find those. I'm gonna start, pass this out, thank you. <coughs> and I'd like to let you know that we're hosting author Elena Georgiou with her debut collection of short stories, The Immigrant's Refrigerator. Um, she'll be doing a reading and a talk with Lori Stravrand of the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program. That's next week, the 24th at 7 p.m. They will be discussing immigration and how it affects one's story of oneself. That's gonna be an interesting event, so come on out for that. And thanks for coming in this weather tonight. This is really fabulous to have such a nice crowd of poets and poetry fans. Um, I'll introduce our authors. Bianca Stone is a writer and visual artist, born and raised in Vermont. In 2007, she moved to New York City, where she received her MFA from NYU. She collaborated with Ann Carson on Antigonic. Is that the correct? That's right. That's just right, yeah. <laughs> well, because it's about Antigone. Um, it's, it's a pairing of Carson's translation of Antigone and Stone's illustration and comics, and that was published in 2012. Uh, Stone is the author of the poetry collections Someone Else's Wedding Vows, Poetry Comics from the Book of Hours, and most recently, The Mobius Strip Club of Grief, which we have here. <clears throat> Her poems, poetry comics, and nonfiction have appeared in a variety of magazines, including Poetry, Jubilat, and Tin House Magazine. She has returned to live in Vermont with her husband and collaborator, the poet Ben Peace, and their daughter Odette, where they run the Ruth Stone Foundation and Letterpress Studio. Allison Prine's poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Plowshares, The Virginia Quarterly Review, Shenandoah, Harvard Review, Michigan Quarterly Review, and Prairie Schooner, among others. Her debut collection of poems, Steel, was chosen by Jeffrey Harrison for the Cider Press Review Book Award and was published in January of 2016. Um, Steele was then named a finalist for the 2017 Vermont Book Award, and Allison lives in Burlington, where she works as a psychotherapist. Please help me welcome Allison Prime. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear okay? I can't tell if this is really doing anything. Yeah, okay, good. Um, Wow, thank you all for, well, thank you, Samantha, for those introductions, and I've always wanted to read at Bear Pond Books, so this is <laughs> really special, and for me to read as part of Poem City, which is an amazing series of events, um, it's very exciting, and there's so many nice faces to see here tonight, and you all braved a, an ice storm, so that's great, and it is a complete honor for me to read with Bianca. 
and um, like like most poets, my home is you know I have tons and tons of poetry books, but I have a special shelf of poetry books in my bedroom, which is a small shelf of the poetry books that are the poets that I, I sort of most cherish and who really sustain me. And since I first made that little poetry shelf, I've had um, Ruth Stone poetry books, Bianca's grandma on that shelf. And then, hey, you guys, come on in. Um, and then in the last few years, nestled against the Ruth Stone poetry books on the shelf are the Bianca Stone poetry <laughs> books on the shelf. So. Um, I thought it would be kind of fun to start the reading tonight by reading a couple small Ruth Stone poems that are my favorites. This one is called Mantra from the next galaxy, which is probably for sale here too. Mantra. When I am sad, I sing, remembering the red-winged blackbird's clack then I want no thing except to turn time back to what I had before love made me sad. When I forget to weep, I hear the peeping tree toads creeping up the bark. Love lies asleep and dreams that everything is in its golden net. And I am caught there too when I forget. And then from this In the Dark Collection, I wanted to read the poem called Bianca. <laughs> <laughs> On the cement belt over the cement playground, buses, cars, trucks move from one side to the other, hyphens of traffic, dashes from nowhere to nowhere. We sit on the benches under the sycamore, and in the almost indestructible play yard, Bianca finds a throng of dandelions. Her tenderness gathers them up, her yellow hair hanging over them, her astringent herbal essence, her small hands filling passion's bitter cup. Now I want to read you some poems from my book, Steel, which came out in 2016. I don't know how to hold my microphone and situate myself. This is the first poem in the collection. It's called The Engineers Taught Us. To check. 100 times a day and tomorrow we will keep on checking. Everything is here. Messages, filters, compass, Wisdom, music, news of the world, time of day everywhere. Locators, something of my old life. The childhood neighbor's laugh, burned patch from the shag rug of 1979, phone numbers of the dead. When I admitted that for months after his suicide, I left my brother voicemails, my sisters all said they had called him too. We are believers. Dear engineers, please put me in touch with those who have trespassed against me. The fortune teller will not take the engineer to be her lawfully wedded wife. Together they will not provide the navigation tools to fill me with a greenhouse of hibiscus. My smartphone offers no shelter. There is only building from the inside and it's necessary loneliness. It's a terrible machine that won't let me lose. Wherever. The train I rode used to roll by here when I was on my way out of what I have since gone back to. I can still feel the strain of exile as the world slip behind and see from the window the flat water of the lake as it replicated the sky. Purple, gray, and pale yellow. We called it blue. 
Sometimes I would step off the platform and find the afternoon air had softened like a face asleep. Or I would turn from the memory of losing and there, buttercups in the grass. The railroad bed is now rugged with ragweed. The old ties crumble into dirt. Follow this rail a long, long way and you'll never get to where I never got to either. Brother and sister. I notice that Wednesday keeps repeating after a pause like rain. Time is the room I can't get out of. Only in sleep can I slip through the back door. In my dream, you are alive again. A sweet reprieve where I compose a new prelude. What you had of mine was not earned, but inscribed in the face behind my face. A brother and sister are like magnets, pulling and repelling each other. In our childhood games, we named a, a safety and someone to be it. Then we went back home again. I don't know what it is about bookstores, but the bookstore readings are like the most quiet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do people not breathe in bookstores? <laughs> Never like anyone ever, no one ever coughs. Or... <laughs> Fortune teller. <coughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Fortune teller. What did I want from her? I already know one half of life is to build and the other half for wind to dismantle. I know a person's gait conveys the number of stones in their heart. I know history is being swallowed in the din of the television as the screens grow larger and larger until we will walk right into the picture. The fortune teller promised one day I would learn to stop breathing. One day I could close my eyes. Next time around, I will be a city pigeon. Iridescent as a pearl, I will spread out on the currents with my flock and scavenge along the cement. Please, drop some crumbs for me. So, as Samantha pointed out, the theme of loss echoes through my poetry and certainly echoes through this collection, Steel. Um, I, my mother died in a car accident when I was a child and this next couple of poems are about that. This one is called Rings. My mother died young, teaching me that the soul lives in costume jewelry and a broken watch. Light repeats itself with brave conviction, a lesson in compassion on the walls of old buildings. Humiliation makes us better lovers. It makes us better shelters. I learned to build by tossing stones into water. All ghosts have the same thesis which can be heard deep from the throat of every morning, sounding like an echo of your voice. This poem's called Resemblance. The poinsettia bleeds milk from the broken leaf. Those are not blossoms. Snow fills in and covers up. You are reading a book about sisters talking. I write down everything we won't say, what we shared, the meals, hundreds, thousands even, flank sticks, shit on a shingle, fish sticks, long before your house and pesto and you're a mother and I'm not, and the snow comes back. 
People say we look alike, but we spent years not being alike. Through all the sting and scrape of childhood, through all the smallness, all the nearness, questions. At this point, there are no surprises. Each comfort, each hurt falls where the groove is worn. I was four, and you were seven, and the snow caused it. Our story is so long, it outlasts us. I'm going to bed on an air mattress on your daughter's bedroom floor. It's Christmas Eve. Forty years ago, we slept on bunk beds in the brick house on Folkestone Drive while our parents argued in whispers on what would be their last night together. The snow had already begun. I would throw myself in front of a train for you. Isn't that the expression? But her story doesn't go like that. We were in the back seat and no one could stop the car skidding over the dotted line. It was Christmas and so it'll always be balsam and sugar and milk from a stem. I hate it in the movies when they kill off the woman to make us love her. But it worked for our mother, didn't it? When I go by the sliding glass of an emergency room entrance and I glimpse the faces of two people leaning anxiously toward one another on stiff plastic chairs, I think, that's you, that's me. So I'm gonna read one more poem from Steele and then I thought I'd read a few of my newer poems. And this last poem I'm going to read is uh, actually a poem about long love. Somebody told me I should always read this poem. Um, it's a love poem for my partner of now 25 years, my wife Kelly. It's called Naming the Waves. Above the harbor, these clouds refuse to be described, except in the language with which they describe themselves. I stand here in the morning stillness, which, which is of course not a stillness, the sky spreading open to the east with amber light while drifting away to the west. Here I can sense how the world spins us precisely in its undetectable turn somehow both towards and away. The blue of the harbor holds the sky in its calm gaze. This is a love poem, be patient. Mm -hmm. Between you and me, nothing leaves, everything gathers. I will name for you each wave rolling up on the harbor sand. This is the first breath of sleep. This, the cloth of your mother's dress, this, the cadence of our long conversation. I want to show you how everything on this harbor has been broken. Shells, glass, rust, bones, and rock. Crushed into this expanse of glittering sand, immune to ruin, now rocking in the slow exhale of the tide. I'm going to just read a few newer poems before we get to hear Bianca's poems. This poem is called Coming Out. It was in Thunder Mountain from Kimakaya. Coming Out. I knew when the small plane I was riding in touched down in the fog. I knew watching my stepmother's hands work the rock garden behind the house. I didn't want the circle to close. I couldn't see myself in the dress, so shaven. I knew because I loved to move through water, the way it yielded, the way it took me in its mouth. I knew, watching our foxhound when he slipped out of the leash, how he tore after scent down our shady street. I just wanted to sleep in the wild strawberries with my chopped off hair. And this is a very new poem. The working title is Drive Home on Route 22A on a Cold Day in April. <laughs> <laughs> 
From the passenger side window, I spot a bald eagle shifting in high bare branches above stiff brown fields. We are trying not to talk about the family or the past. Sky finally clear after weeks suspended between rain and snow. I see an old brick house in the rear view mirror, half finished renovation with torn blue tarps thrashing in the wind. A year before he died, our father took us to an aviary where an injured bald eagle was brought to recover and sat flightless for years in a glass enclosure. What does it mean to be rescued? Let's pretend this isn't a memory or a cage or a house cold with sadness. An eagle can live 20 years longer in captivity than in the wild. In one version of my life, no one left the house and nothing happened to us. So everything happened within us and it was just as bad. <laughs> Read two more. This is another new poem called To My Brother on the 10th Anniversary of His Suicide. Things I need to tell you, I cup against my chest like a messenger pigeon. Each accusation, each plea, each time another of our kin is losing ground. And then I toss them in the air in a chaos of silvered wings. When we were young, us kids took sides while the marriage that made us was played like a game of Jenga. Building blocks slid out one by one. Now there are no sides, no straight lines, no corners, and time swings around like a shadow nailed at my feet. Our time together comes in memory the hour you spent gently untangling a thick snarl from the back of my childhood hair. And it shoves my heart further open on its stiff hinge, making you feel closer the longer you are dead. I'm going to end with another, with the spring poem I wrote last spring. When it was a little more like spring. <laughs> it's called Far North. Spring rolls in hard, swift, brash, heedless. Box elder saplings, blackberry, and burdock break ground any place we leave alone. A dozen dark purple tulips sprang up by the front steps. Did we plant them? Another gesture I can't remember what I conceived, things I once said with such conviction, how I got from there to here. I'm not the person who moved here from Pittsburgh decades ago, but I feel her inside me, earnest, righteous, drowning in want. I find a broken blue egg in front of our house and I wanna ask my wife if she believes it is an omen of loss or a beginning. Sometimes I find her crying in the shower. I'm struck by all I can't take from her hands, like the water running between them. Thank you so much. and that was so gorgeous. Mm. I just want to like let it sit for a second. At the Mobius Trip Club of Grief, come on in. The ladies are XXX. If you want the skinny ones, we got skeletons cracking around those poles. And over at the bar, there's Grandma, her breasts hanging to her stomach, gorgeous with a ship Manhattan, murderous as a maxi pad. At the Mobius Trip Club of Grief, all the drinks are free. 
grocery store rosé and gallon bottles on every table and the dead don't want your tips. They just want you to listen to their poems. <laughs> don't do anything dangerous and call every once in a while. In fact, they tip you at the MSCOG with checks. With a sigh, they'll throw one down at your feet. We make it rain with checks. Then the dead are sitting at the back of the club, dying further, sniffing, shuffling into the bathrooms, holding their skin in their hands, farting methane and sobbing across the stage with their last meal. It's the raciest show in town. And ladies, there's men, too, hanging themselves on the bathroom doors and from the rafters, totally naked, with their cocks in their hands, tears coming down their faces. Ladies, you'll love how their feet smell, how their bones protrude, how they leave no note. So good to read with Allison, whose book I just spent a lot of time with and adore. Um, and I feel such a kinship in our exploration of loss and family grief. Um, So, thank you, Allison. And thank you, Matthew Dickman, for being here, editor of this book. Um, I owe a lot to him for it being in existence, and if it's good, it's, I owe him that, too. <laughs> but it's up for debate. Lap dance. I think everyone's glad I'm dead, said the stripper with the caved-in face. Her fingers were bone and no sinew. She flapped her arms at the two wrens caught up in the rafters, staring down on the empty dance hall. Chirps rained like sparks from the electric saws in their hearts. No one is glad anyone is dead, but there is a certain comfort in knowing the dead can entertain us if we wish. We line up outside looking drowned, telling whoever comes our way that we are falling very fast and that we are fine. The dead are wrinkled as jet streams, cutting across the room with glasses lost on their heads. Vitamins dissolving like milk under their tongues, their hair still growing, crackling out of their skulls in time-lapsed loops, and we file in in ones and twos, clinging to our tragedies, finding our favorite face. And it looks back at us with indifference, contempt, chill disappointment you never came much when i was alive says one with red hair lying on her side a botticelli on the stage and now you want a piece twenty dollars for five minutes i'll hold your hand in my own i'll tell you you were good to me i'm actually only going to read one more poem sort of a longer poem, um, and this, this poem meditates more on grief for the living, which is just as massive. Um, it's called Blue Jays. I haven't read this one out loud yet at a reading, so you get to be the lucky <laughs> test crowd. Um, but I will say now, thank you so much for coming and I love Montpelier so much and uh, I don't know, it's just, it is crappy out. So I applaud you for <laughs> not making excuse up to yourself about not coming to the poetry reading. Blue Jays. Um, great men will tell us how they rose from nothing but mom's a teenage heartbreak, deadly bright blue jay in the snow. Her vivid black beak, queenly inside a flush of blue. She's a prologue the size of a whole book. She's real poppies that will make you sleep. So much motherland in her. I'm adrift in an age of not giving up. A fog lies over everything when she's upset. People used to live in the attic ones who snuck down when we went out to use the toilet and steal the spoons. Nothing's up there, I said, though I had no idea. Mom writing down license plates while we sat in the car outside the bakery eating croissants, 
So many similarities in numbers, it can be beauty to see. In the fields of Illinois, mom danced topless for the soldiers headed to war, probably be the last thing I see before I hit the shit, one man told her. In blue, here is a shell for you. Text messages like leaves on a river moving swiftly toward a vast sea of misunderstanding. Wouldn't it be nice to live more than one lifetime? I want to be someone else for a little while. I'm the village idiot savant standing at an empty wishing well, lighting a joint and getting paranoid, telling one yarn after another to anyone who will listen. Mom was always changing her name, asking to be called something different. One day she went into the courthouse and wrote the name Blue Jay on a blank line. The J that will gather all the other J's when a dead one is found. Assemble the others to grieve. The name is still on her license like a hieroglyph, unusable, dust long ago gathered upon. Who are you? she asked one night, standing beside the four-poster bed in the dark. Who are you? You know me, don't you? I can't remember the words to that one lullaby. I've grown backwards and down, no room to sit, no private place to plunder, tall as the tallest French bisque doll in the house, and I barely fit into this collection of genius never shipped into society, only stockpiled for the end of the world. I bought her mind whispering and the motivation manifesto. I bought the life-changing magic of tidying up, left it among the Jewish mysticism books, and later it appeared in a pile by the front door. Take your self-help book back with you, she said, filling a glass with ice and Diet Pepsi, like an ocean wave foaming over stones. My holes were empty like a cup. In every hole the sea came up till it could come no more. Enough, enough. Now I start my own cult. I lead some commune of rapture for these wounds, but it does no good. Everyone commits great big acts of suicide together in my head. Back during our Mormon days, brief, mom wouldn't let us go to temple out in Utah and baptize the dead. But I can baptize your father, I insisted, who hanged himself all those years ago. He was a Jew, mom says. He doesn't want to be baptized into the three Mormon heavens. And that was that. Soon after, we stopped attending, and really, I was glad. I didn't want to baptize the dead so much as get into a swimming pool and be held down by a gentle hand of the priesthood. Your brother got too serious, Mom said, smoking in the car, in her wool jacket, with the elastic loops for shotguns, shells, and the flannel insert and loose M&Ms in the pockets. I loved her in that coat. He said, he was, he said I was sinning for drinking coffee. Nowadays, it's like two cocktails and my endorphins are spent with a big shiny silver dollar and I'm an old doll that talks gibberish when pulled apart. I rush home with my golden ticket of shit and pass out in the empty tub. No one will talk about her father's death in a new way. It came out quietly that he liked to wear women's clothes. Tenderly, mom tells me this his unfinished dissertation that crumbles in my hands, his poems from 1943, soldier ballads done with quivering golf pencils. I'm so alone. I'm so alone without you, my darling. Oh, I wish him on her. I wish him on her to be loved, to be loved properly by a father probably feels great, like winning a medal. There's so much joy in this poem I'm trying to convey, how much I love my mother, the way I love birds. The blue jay always is the biggest bird around the feeder, makes a strange loud song, a little aggressive, but gorgeous, known for its intellectual, complex social systems with tight family bonds, a biblical fondness for acorns, spreading oak trees into existence after the last glacial period. What are those immigrant Lithuanian Jews who all married Goyim with red hair? 
after his wife died, great uncle Jack, your father's brother, wouldn't throw anything out, filling his house with newspapers and New Yorkers. But oh, his satyrs in Baltimore, we screamed through, so happy. The delicious sounds of his muttering Hebrew, can we go back? This poem was for you, hoarders of my blood. The gentle climate of mothers that shakes the White House and other times drives you insane with silence. The silent treatment. The defining absence of noise. Like an expanding stain, damp and long, a face of need. Need the more forceful the longer it gets. Typing out sad sentences like a telegram into the hands of the wrong person. My sweet placemat I place at my table each day. When I sit down with a blue jay, the seeds fall out of my mouth. Do you know the game? The game is leading you out of the dark, and then you long to go back in, or blowing on your hands to make a fire, or building something on top of another thing, and one is more fragile than the other. My sister and I are stars in our own reality show that no one watches but us. His mom responded, spread out in omnipotent banter, waiting for our relationship to really begin. To be loved without a fight, with a calm center, not passing a mood around like a screaming infant, this black market DVD collection that cannot be watched except when the moon is waning and no one paid the electric bill and they're threatening to take the house and the hostile cats are locked in the bathroom and then you can't look away for anything. Watch me loving you forever on the strip of land we call grief but is only life. Do you know the game? The game is being called unhappy just in case or gratitude as a weakness and we play it sometimes when there is nothing else to do thunder and lightning outside turns to reverence. Realizing your parents are just human is a large part of mature development. Some people never get there, and being there is everescent. Suddenly, this need for honey and everything, seasickness bands on my wrists remind me of my old perversity. Blackout incisions on the skin and injury, open eye shaped, women's shame shaped. Get up out of the internet, lawnmower man. I'm concerned about the way we keep looking for something to ease the pain. I'm not yet like a Navy SEAL, the way they love it when things are miserable. Living is enduring painful situations, but living is not really reality, which we know is such a lark, Mom, don't we? An exotic bird comes to solve herself in the back cloth of ash trees. And I dream again, I am so articulate with my vicious insults. Grief for the living will ruin your appetite. How much do bird species watch other bird species? Like blue terriers, Emily Dickinson said of the jays, mimicking the cry of a hawk. The old world jay who will intuit his female state of mind and find her the food she most desires. The jay will watch closely and keep track. Being loved depends upon it. I've been watching you from this damp branch, the wily sun across your sullen face, your bones among your features, your mouth curled, beautiful, angry, a child's lips that whirl on a, whirl, on a word, your sisters from the same Edenic womb who cross the Red Sea of the maddening mother cannot reason together. The jays scatter across the country, surviving on the delicacy of larva. The feed swings like a crystal pendulum saying, yes. I miss you in this world, I said to you yesterday, sitting on the couch while you threaded tiny Italian imported beads onto a string in your manner of magnificent lamps illuminating the veil Dickinson noticed hovering over the imperfectly beheld face, fluttering with your outbreath of cigarette smoke, an old wound reddening around you, your genius trapped like a moth on the screened in porch of your pain, waiting 
in your house for a miracle. Oh, mother, it will never come without your consent. Mothers are all I have ever known, and my loyalty never amassed enough. My labyrinth, my confusion of jays, my cacophonous aggression, university of humor and ingenious abilities. And I come back again and again to hang out and argue, dearest playmate, won't you come out and play with me? I'm dead and in hell. I've known that for years, you say. And I step quietly back into the night. Thank you so much. with the mic. What do you think? I'll sit down and let the stars shine. <laughs> Even though they're wearing black. But yeah, questions, yeah. talking. <clears throat> Blue Jays in my yard this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and they told you to read that poem. <laughs> <laughs> they're not the most beautiful sounding, <laughs> but they're beautiful. What was the earliest seed for the strip club of Greek poems? Did you say? Is well, um, Ruth had a poem called The Mobius Strip of Grief. Um, and she wrote a lot about uh, the loss of her husband, who died very young and violently, um, as well as her family members that she uh, I had all lost by the time um, I was alive. Uh, and after she, I was very close with her, and after she passed away, um, I started writing a lot of elegies in response. Um, and going back to her poetry, and I was struck by um, just how I felt like I was almost taking a torch of grief from her because it felt so accurate, and I'd never understood that accuracy yet. Even for this small loss, it wasn't as sort of violent as her loss, um, and it got me thinking about uh, just the sort of endlessness that's passed down through family to family of, of a sort of tragedy. Um, big or small, uh, true or not true, it doesn't really matter, um, but just families hold on to this um, and, and can pass it down to their children and their children are sort of expected to take it on and it comes as sort of like big myth mythology that's very important to the whole structure of the family and um, so out of that one poem, and sort of my own experiences with grief, it all came out. It was obviously a pun that happened in my head, and I, I just ran with it <laughs> without much intention and thinking it would never see the light of day. <laughs> Making it rain with check is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously, you know, I, times are different, but all, when all we know that growing up, it was very much checks, you know, like, get a check from grandma, you know. <laughs> uh, now it's not Venmo or whatever. Ven Venmo me. Venmo. <laughs> what about the Joy Mitchell in there? Here's a shell for you. Yeah, I... Uh, well, I think that came from just that um, my mom was very of that time period, um, and the song is called Blue, and it's a blue jay. Uh, that's how, to me, that song is very connected with my relationship with her, so. 
I shouldn't think that's the song. Um, no, that's not Green. Never mind. But that whole album is very mm -hmm. um, painful in some ways. I think it's green for the daughter and yeah. blue for the, hus the husband, the, yeah. the father the of father. the daughter. I always assumed it was the father of the baby shoot. Hey boy. I always think that students who are writing fiction poetry should study psychology instead of literature. <laughs> <laughs> or both, you know, just like doesn't even matter. So um, I know you've been asked this question in a million different ways, like how it informs and um, so, I guess I'm trying, I'm, I want to ask, and wait, you haven't asked before, but I'm sure there's no way. But, um, like, it, when, when you're sitting in a session with a patient, you know what I mean, and are you ever struck in, to respond in poems? You know what I mean? Is there, is, is there continuity between those two things for you, I guess? And vice versa, maybe. I, you know, I would respond say, to a poem as a psychologist, a psychiatrist, you know. I would say for the most, I mean, for the most part, the, the, they're very different parts of my brain, and they stay pretty separate. Um, I feel like, like the language and the way that I communicate as a therapist is, you know, like a completely different vocabulary, and it's like trying t to see and speak as clearly and directly as possible. And I feel like, as a poet, I'm almost like, trying not to see too clearly so I can see what's under under and under and sort of access the subconscious more. Um, so for the most part, I feel like they're very separate parts of my life and parts of my brain. They balance each other well. But every once in a while, like, I'll be in a session and it's not like usually like the whole like gestalt of what the client's saying, but they might like say one phrase and I'll kind of be like, Wow. <laughs> that was a really good phrase. Yeah. <laughs> I might have to use that. <laughs> and on the and in the flip, when you're when after you've written the poem and you've tried to obfuscate yourself from yourself mm -hmm. and from the work, does the therapist step in? I mean, I don't try to psychoanalyze myself at all. I didn't so say I don't. they stepped in welcome. But yeah, no, I mean, not really. I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, I guess there's always that sort of frame, a little bit of that framework. I mean, I do have a very sort of psychological perspective, and I'm sure that that comes out. Um, but I think that with my poetry, I'm always, you know, I feel like a lot I'm trying to deal in poetry with things maybe I'm not ready to deal with in other ways. So I don't want to look too hard. Yeah. I'm trying not to look too hard. Um, and if I do look too hard, then it's probably going in the recycle <laughs> bin, because I think that I think I'm ready to address things in poetry before I'm ready to really address them more directly. And I remember being in workshop and being like, oh, this is how you turn workshop into free therapy. <laughs> um, because everybody's like interpreting your poem and like telling it back to you and you can't say anything. And it's like always all this stuff comes out that you're like, oh my god. <laughs> this is a poem about my father. Like, I didn't even realize. <laughs> yeah. What? What? Oh, sorry. What um, makes a poem about grieving or about grief not work? Like, what are some things that you think either help or hurt um, in your work in writing about grief? <laughs> what do you think, Bianca? <laughs> well, all the, what I would say about that is that, like, for me, like, the, a lot of the elegies that didn't work that I wrote felt too, like, sort of maudlin or like um, not unique enough mm -hmm. and I think that they were good for me to write for myself and like I had to write them and I didn't want to stop myself from doing it but um, I felt like I didn't want to I didn't want to like share it with anybody <coughs> unless I was like doing it justice um, and sometimes that meant um, holding back a little bit of maybe what was more personal, uh, emotional, uh, yeah, sentimental. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I think that the sentimental such tally. an inherited vocabulary around grief. It is hard to be original about it sometimes. Yeah. I mean, love, too, is the same. Well, everything important to write about is hard to write. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think that for me, I, I don't... I, I, that whole, like, like, like when I watch really scary things on TV or movies, I do that thing. Where I, and I feel like that is what I do a little bit when I'm writing. And, and I think that there's a part of me that doesn't want to be writing about what I'm writing about. And I know, like, when I, like, with Steel, when I first put it together, I try, like, not that they aren't, like, almost, like, all grief poems, but I tried to, like, somehow hide them all in the back of the manuscript. And I, <laughs> and I remember, like, when I finally talked to, some, you know, I got some advice about it. And the poet was like, um, why are you hiding all your good poems in the back of the manuscript? And what are these like really empty poems that you're putting in the front? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, to see the smoke screen. And then similarly with my new manuscript I'm working on, which I got, the, like I was really lucky and I won um, in this like lottery fundraiser thing for the Ruth Stone thing. I got like Bianca Stone to look at. My <laughs> and she basically gave me very similar advice, like, <laughs> yeah. Like, like, these are therapy. all poems about grief, and I was like, yeah. oh, I, this one too. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's you know. So I yeah, think you I, embrace it. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think it's helpful. Yeah, it's yeah. like this is this is what it is, and so I don't. You know, I I have a hard time even finding poems that aren't about grief. But um, I think I, I think I try to apologize for them or hide them. But I think that all of us are grieving so much. And I think there is a hunger for poems. And in a way, it's like nice for me to read with Bianca and read this like gorgeous book that is saying, like, this is about grief and realizing that I can just sort of move towards that and embrace it, even though, I mean, you know, I think anything vulnerable, I mean, nothing can really be good if it doesn't have vulnerability, but the vulnerability also makes it Hard. I find it very hard to judge. That's what my poetry group is for. Oh, <laughs> you guys, have you had a question? I, I think that the way that both of you are talking about your your dead actually makes them come alive longer. So poetry is like a seance, mm -hmm. and the poem engineer that Allison in. Um, <laughs> Where you mentioned that you're talking, you're calling your mother, you know, and I, I'm wondering at, at what stage that was because I've been trying that. I've been texting and calling for three and a half years since my mother died, mm -hmm. and it's been very good for me to do that. I, I recently told her about a cool family event, and I got a response, <laughs> a text back from somebody who inherited her phone number. Oh, wow. <laughs> Small, right. <laughs> but I assume that when you wrote that, there was no texting or the, the danger of that happening. <laughs> well, I did. I mean, I did leave my. It's actually my brother, and I did leave him oh, voicemails for quite a while after he died. And there was a point at which, at one point, I called, and it was somebody else's, and the number was gone. Right, that was kind of hard. I guess like, it's like I guess I can't do this anymore. <laughs> well, I think it is like. Um, especially for Ruth like there was definitely a almost problem with her on being unable to let go of her dead um, it wasn't a problem as a writer because as a writer she produced so much rich poetry that was we were able to like get a lot out of as as readers but I think like there was definitely like a it, it's almost the same as texting somebody <laughs> who's dead, um, to be, you know, spending the rest of your life um, writing poems to them. Um, I don't know. It is keeping them alive in a certain way. It's, it's such a big difference in, like, how people deal with grief, uh, whether or not you're going to sort of decide to move on and let it, let it be passed, and I think both are valid, of course, but... Um, for writers, it's it's harder, probably. Yeah, I have a quick question. 
Do you have a recollection of an article that appeared in Vermont Life magazine about your grandmother that had a gorgeous color photograph of, I assume, your mom? I think it was all three sisters. Maybe 20, maybe more years ago, this vivid color photograph, full page, all these flaming yeah, I redheads. I do remember that, yeah. And I remember loving the article. I don't know if Tom Slayton wrote it or who, but uh, I can't remember the article now, but that image. Yeah. I can't find the magazine. It's somewhere. But um, in fact, I'm trying to find out if I can access it um, if I don't find it. It was, it was a, um, it was a photograph that I never forgot and never left my mind, because it was this mother and this fabulous poet, and these two, gor three gorgeous red, ha long yeah. red-haired women with Bloomsbury like pictures and lamps, shades yeah. and things on the walls that were chaotic but exquisite yeah. and I always yeah. wondered whatever happened that sums it up to that <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you have do you did you ever read that article it was a very yeah I had long a poem article. in it I remember I was in high school I yeah. was a senior in high school and I yeah. I had a poem in it and it was a Grammatical error in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> but yeah, it was like, uh, it was great in Vermont life. I remember that very well. Do you, yeah. did you, do you think of it now in this conversation as idyllic, improbable, and not a, a depiction of? I, I was so stunned with that, the, the, the idea of all these artists, women, and mothers and daughters. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that. I mean, I think that's the greatest thing about... Uh, I, I'm trying to carry it on, definitely. Like, um, we're fixing up my grandmother's house. I turn it into a writer's uh, space oh, and um, carry on that bohemian, <laughs> uh, long, red-haired woman way of... Yeah. Uh, you know, just bringing poetry into the household, and I bring my daughter with me to a lot of events, and I I want to completely share my poetry world with her, and um, it's what my grandma did really well. I mean, I think that was total um, one of the greatest things she did was just she was so open with her poetry with her with her daughters and with her students, and um, and just creating this whole space. Um, for people to come together, and I mean, I, I, that that that's beautiful to me, and that's something I definitely want to carry on as much as I can for other people and for my family, for sure. Does does your grandmother's poetry uh, inspire you more than challenge you, um, or in any way affect you in this in, with a sense of competence? No, it's it's only inspiring and wonderful. For yeah, me. yeah. I mean, I I feel a huge reverence for her poetry. She's my favorite poet, and I like to think of being in conversation with her poetry instead mm -hmm. of it being um, competitive. Because I know her voice is so deeply ingrained in me, and you know, my mom and my aunts as well, um, and their art and stuff like that. So it's it's just ingrained in me. So I don't want to fight it or, or try and top it or anything like that. I just want to sort of honor it and and have it be, it's part of me and um, this book is certainly in conversation with my grandmother's poetry and I, I decided to embrace that and it was actually wonderful creatively. Yeah. Thank you guys all for being here.